Uh, next up is a fireside chat on the deep tech landscape, investment landscape within Europe with two people. Let me first introduce Rinke Zonneveld. Rinke kicked off his career at the Ministry of Economic Affairs, where he spent 16 years in all kinds of roles. 13 years ago, he was appointed as our country's special envoy for SMEs. Around the same time, he left the Ministry of Economic Affairs and went on to found Innovation Quarter, which is the regional development and investment agency of the greater Rotterdam, The Hague area. He managed it for nine years and turned it into one of the most active investors in the Netherlands. Last year, he became the CEO of InvestNL, where he manages 2 billion euros. And the goal of InvestNL is to turn the Netherlands into the most sustainable and innovative country. But besides all of this, he's a very, very beloved person in the Dutch tech ecosystem. Please welcome Rinke Zonneveld. Then Michael, Michael Jackson, in his own words, entrepreneur, some venture backed, some not, some exited, some not. In our words, a successfully exited deep tech entrepreneur turned investor. Michael started his venture career in Silicon Valley and moved to uh, 20 years ago and then moved to Europe, where he is now based. He's invested in hundreds of startups and over 40 funds and currently sits on the boards of several investment committees of deep tech VC funds. He's named by The Telegraph as one of the most influential tech investors in Europe. But Rinke actually described him in a call in a nice way, I thought, last week. Quite the phenomenon on the internet. Please welcome Michael Jackson. This conversation is about the deep tech uh, investment landscape in Europe. Can I ask, how are we doing, or should I ask, how badly are we doing? He's a phenomenon. He's very critical, very critical about the situation in Europe, and I will bring in the nuances. It's Please, constructive Michael. Constructive criticism, right? I mean, it's not like it's not like attacking Europe. It's just trying to kick Europe in the ass a bit. Now, so if you look at, I mean, the, you know, if you're looking at sort of, you know, Europe kind of missed out on the software boom. I mean, there's only been one company created in Europe in the last 50 years with a market cap above 100 billion. Uh, in the tech space, and that's ASML, which is kind of fitting that we're here in Eindhoven. Europe has a lot of government initiatives, but oftentimes those government investors don't, their KPI is not necessarily financially driven. And so, yeah, if you look at it on a per capita basis, I mean, Europe needs to significantly increase its venture capital spend. I think it significantly has to do that in deep tech. So if you look at sort of where the EIF has spent money over the last 20 years, so for every one euro that went into funds that were backing biotech, pharma, photonic, semiconductors, over three were going into software VCs. Because again, they were trying to play this catch-up game to the US. And you had some spectacular failures where you had um, Quero. I don't know if anyone remembers Quero, but Quero was when the French and German governments tried to uh, create a European Google, which they ended up dumping like 2 billion euros in and ended up being a complete and total write-off. I think Europe shouldn't be afraid of letting the free market dictate a bit more in terms of how the ecosystem grows. It should think, let the free market dictate a bit more. Yeah, because I mean, if you look at, you know, if you look at kind of the government kind of creating things, I mean, look, I, I, I you know, was hanging out with some people from ASML recently and they were, their comment was that ASML grew despite the Dutch government, not mm. because of the Dutch government. Okay, um, in what way? Controversial here. Um, I think they just saw kind of along the lines, a lot of kind of the Dutch government kind of and the European government bringing up roadblockers where if you look at sort of what was the success kind of points with ASML, it was often, you know, getting money from Intel or whoever else. Okay, so companies from the U.S. bought, became customers of ASML and they grew despite the Dutch government. Yeah, I mean, I think Intel at one point in time had what, five, I don't know, you Dutch can tell me this better, I think at one point in time they had 5% of it in the market cap of, mm. of, sorry, the public shares of ASML. I think, so again, I think one of the key points here is I think instead of the governments in Europe trying to sort of cosplay or role play as VCs, they would be much better off being customers of first resort as opposed to trying to play at VC. Because as having been an entrepreneur, the first thing I wouldn't want on my cap table or my board is, you know, the European Union or, or and nothing against them. It's just if you're, if you're trying to, as a fast growing company, you don't necessarily want a mid tier bureaucrat on your board or on your cap table. Okay, so no government on your board table and the government should give more room to private investors is what you're saying and also become customers more before you answer i want to go to rinka to, can you respond to what you just well, heard honestly enough i think i agree on most aspects with what michael is saying except for the asml story because everyone here in the room said knows the history of asml knows that 
especially in the first 10 to 15 years, it was thanks to government support that ASML is, is still here. And everyone who has been part of the ASML story can tell you that, Michael. But it's, um, of course, we need more. Uh, we have to step up our game in, in deep tech investments in Europe, without any doubt. And that already starts at academia. So how can we create more knowledge-intensive startups from academia with the right support and the right kind of money? But it, um, and I'm the CEO of a government-backed investor. But what I love to do is to make ourselves finish mm. in the long run. Mm. But the honest story is, is that if you look at the private scene in Europe, and especially in the Netherlands, there's hardly any institutional capital flowing into the asset class of VC. Uh, most like pension private, funds or, yeah, yeah. Well, innovation industries is, mm. is the, the example in the Netherlands who have attracted a lot of money from pension funds. Well, a lot of money, it's still only 150 million. Mm. Um, second, a lot of private investors, they were playing cuddle soccer around uh, software as a service. So cuddle soccer? Yeah, well, Kluitjes football. So, uh, so Kluitjes uh, football, cuddle uh, soccer. 80% um, <laughs> of VC funds in the Netherlands until pretty recently were all focusing on the same kind of companies. E Platform technology, yeah. uh, software as a service, etc. And private investors have the tendency to move towards the point where risk and return is optimal. And if you look, for example, at deep tech, mm. we know it's very capital intensive. It takes a real long time to earn back your money. And that's not where a lot of private investors are willing to go. Mm. So that's where I think not only in, 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 in the Netherlands, but in Europe as a whole, but it's also what you've seen in Israel, it's also what you've seen in parts of the US, is that there is a role to play for the government. But what we shouldn't do is to crowd out private investors. We should crowd in private investors. Mm. So what we have done, we have invested in almost all Dutch deep tech uh, VC funds. And we have done direct investments in the photonics industry, in smart photonics, effect photonics, Lionx, etc. But always joining up and teaming up with private investors. And you and persuade crowding, them to come and, in and or not? crowding them in. Well, yeah. How do you get them in? How do you persuade these VC funds to, well, we, is there a role for you even to persuade them? Yeah, sometimes there is, mm -hmm. and sometimes they convince us. Um, it's, it's like a love story, yeah? how do you find each other? Uh, but I think we only have a role to play where the private sector isn't willing to take up the whole needed fee, uh, investment sum, uh, not yet, or not a whole and that's where our role is to play. Mm. And I, I, will, I think I'm, I'm a big sports fan. And if you're in the stands, it's always different than when you're on the pitch. If we would step out of the game as government-backed investors in the Netherlands or in Europe, it would all fall apart. It would all fall apart. But I think that's what we have to understand. I think the government has to do a better job of having carrots and sometimes sticks to incentivize the private investors. It has to do a better job at what? Having carrots and sticks to incentivize the private investors. Okay. I mean, if you look at like, you know, if you look at sort of the, when the U.S. changed their pension fund laws to allow them to invest in private capital, um, that was in 79, and they allowed the pension funds to invest up to 10% of their capital. Um, and I think right now there's not necessarily the right incentives by government. So there's a lot of systemic issues that are preventing a lot of large institutional investors from investing in venture capital funds in Europe. I mean, some countries in Europe, pension funds uh, are not allowed at all to invest in venture capital because it's considered a high-risk asset class. So the government laws mandate that they're going to invest 0%. There's things like that in Europe. In these mm -hmm. same countries that also have large national VC arms that are investing, but that they don't incentivize the private investors to do the same thing. And then they sort of cry a foul saying, well, you know, private investors aren't investing. Well, it's like you haven't incentivized them to do such a thing. Um, and I think there has to be a bit more thought process done by government in how to really unlock the potential of the private sector. I mean, if you look at the Netherlands, right, uh, on a per capita basis, it's got very large pension funds. 
Um, yet their exposure to venture capital, particularly Dutch venture capital, is almost nothing. I think TechLeap, TechLeap did a report or with McKinsey, I think it was last year, where I think the overall exposure for Dutch pension funds to it, it's it's almost non-existent. And you're saying it's because there aren't the right conditions <laughs> created. It's even prohibited, or yeah. And at the same point in time, you're, you're, you've got a lot of pension funds who, you know, if you're if you're looking at sort of the future of demographics in Europe with an aging population, you have pension funds who have been reliant on um, sort of low yield investments, and I think a lot of them missed out on this sort of tech boom. And they don't like. There's more North American pension fund money in European tech than there is European pension fund money in European tech. There's more think. North American pension fund money in European tech than yeah. there is European pension fund money yeah, the, in the, European the British, tech. Okay. The British yeah. Venture Capital Association. That's did. true. That's true. And I totally agree with Michael that we should find ways to incentivize them or to seduce them. And on request of the Minister of Economic Affairs. I was going to say, you spent yeah. 16 years there. Can you speak to it from a government perspective well, or is it too long ago? I, I, and I left over 10 years yeah, ago. Of course, so, yeah. But for me, it's... it's uh, uh, at the moment, I'm having all this discussion with the pension funds, how to seduce them to do more in VCS and asset class in, in the Netherlands. And we're looking at very good examples across Europe. For example, in, in Denmark and in Belgium, they have set up funded fund constructs where the pension funds have been de-risked in a way mm -hmm. via their MPIs. Um, but of course, in France, it's a totally different story. If, the, if President Macron says, you have to do this, the pension funds will do it. In England, uh, in the UK recently, they have come up with a, a sort of gentleman's agreement, the, the, the VC industry and uh, the pension funds. So th this will take a, a long while. I had a discussion with one of the uh, CEOs of one of the larger pension funds in the Netherlands two weeks ago, and he is, he's German, and then uh, he was explaining how it works within his pension funds, and then I said, so we're aiming at two, t uh, 2025, and he said, well, that will be really, really speedy. Mm. Uh, so th th it's what did he think? 2030 or even later? No, 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 much earlier, much earlier. I'm, I'm, I'm quite convinced that um, th that th that the pension funds will open up their eyes for the possibilities as VC as an asset class. But I think we have to help them to take the, to make the first step. So, what, for example, what you've seen in Denmark, they've set up a Fox fund, and there was a scheme where uh, the half of the, 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 the pension fund money was being de-risked de by the, the National Promotional in, uh, uh, the Institute. So they gave back a, a, a yearly return of 6% to the pension funds and put in the money they, cut from, they, they lent from the pension funds directly into a fund of fund. And now they've set up a second fund. The pension funds say, okay, we're going to do 100% directly in equity. So it's it's... It takes a while. It's a mindset shift uh, within the industry, within the pension industry, but we're getting there. And I hear you name a few examples of things that are going better and better within Europe, at least. It takes a while. It takes a while. It, it, you know, uh, this, this, this continent has been far too prosperous for a, a, a too long of a time. We're, we're, we're naive. If you look at what's happening geopolitical, geopolitically. We're naive, yeah? Yeah, we're naive. Yeah, there are two major power blocks, the U.S. and China, and uh, we haven't uh, grasped what the game is. We have to play as a European Union in being a third power block uh, 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 worldwide. So we've been naive. Um, so we have to build up our own industry again um, from an open strategic autonomous uh, point of view. That means also that we have to make sure that we make the US and China also dependent on us. You, you can't become an autarky again. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not something you, you have to strive for. But uh, I think we've been too naive too long. And um, um, we don't understand power as an economic tool mm. enough. We don't understand power as an economic tool enough. Yeah. Mm. I see you nod your head, and I see you continuously nod your head. Yeah, no, I, I think I mean, Europe needs to wake up. I think that's Europe just, needs to wake up. It's just, it's just an obvious thing. I think, unfortunately, in Europe, you also just have, I think, still individual national interests take precedent over sort of actual European national, or as a sort of continental issues. Uh, I think it's one of the big issues, because it's, 
you know, there's a French agenda, German agenda, British mm. agenda, and, and et cetera, and that necessarily kind of crowds out sort of a pan-European agenda. And okay. unfortunately, at scale, you're going to have to have a lot more pan-European um, cohesiveness. And one of those things happens with, if you want institutional investors to be interested in, in sort of backing European tech companies, you have to have exits. And I think one of the big systemic issues in Europe is the exit market is, is quite weak, and one of the reasons is the capital markets are small and fragmented. Mm. Um, so if you... The capital markets are small and fragmented, and therefore the exit market is quite weak. Yeah, I mean, if you look at so France, which has pushed, you know, really heavily under or Macron uh, with the BPI and pushed really heavily to kind of create France, remake it sort of a tech startup nation. Uh, the average tech exit in the first half of this year was 10 million euros. Mm -hmm. You're not going to attract a hell of a lot of private institutional investors if your exit exit value is 10 million euros. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's something that. You know, you do. You know, the French want their stock market in Paris. The German wants theirs in Frankfurt. The Dutch want theirs in Amsterdam, etc. And there's not, there's no real single market in Europe. I think it's, it's something that sadly hasn't kind of come into fruition. It's still quite fragmented and blocked. And um, at the end of the day, that's prohibiting. You know, Europe produces amazing science, amazing technology. The problem is, is that the commercialization stage is where it hits a lot of issues. And part of that is just because. You, you don't have, you know, particularly in, in regulated industries, right? If you start talking about biotech, med tech, defense, things like that, if you're starting out in Germany and you get contracts with the German government, that doesn't help you in France, that doesn't help you in the UK, et cetera. You have to go kind of one by one by one by one. Mm -hmm. So there is no one unified market. If Europe could really just focus on, on you know, tearing down some of those, those blocking points that, that prohibit it from being one unified market, I think it'd be far more interesting in terms of exit points, in terms of, of actually being able to scale up. I mean, if you're looking at photonics industry, what Europe is now 16% of the global photonics market. Um, the danger there is it's going to be kind of maybe potentially like the semiconductor market as well, where even as sort of that total net value grows, that piece of the pie in Europe is going to keep shrinking, right? So photonics is, what, $800 billion a year industry, 16% of that is Europe. But if you look at sort of what Europe has done on the semiconductor side, right? So if you look at Europe and the semiconductor, the, you know, the EU came out and said, okay, we want to have 20% of global production in the EU by 2030. Yeah, That's on LinkedIn pipe. you said that is pipe a wild dream. pipe dream. But it's interesting. Tell us what you really think, Michael. No. It is a pipe dream. There's, yeah. no, there's no way in hell Europe is going to produce 20% of semiconductors in Europe by 2030. The interesting thing is Europe said the exact same thing in 2013. They had the same goal for 2020. So they just keep kicking the can down the road every 10 years, and the piece of the pie keeps shrinking. My concern with something like photonics, which is a vitally, you know, strategically important asset that Europe needs to do a great job in, is that they're not doing enough and that 16% is just going to keep getting smaller and they'll come up with another sort of ballpark figure. So I think it's, it's going to have to be, some hard choices are going to have to be made. I think Europe is going to have to understand that you are going to have to throw a lot of money at the winners. Um, I've seen you know, European initiatives where in a specific sector they'll be like, hey, you know, an individual European company, a country wants to start two, three hundred startups in a, in a subsector. That doesn't make sense. Like, like, and, and I've seen that in the Netherlands, I've seen it in other European countries. Um, Denmark had that with robotics. The Netherlands has done that with certain sectors where they want to create, where the KPI is about the quantity and not necessarily the quality, where you're not going to have two or three hundred. The ecosystem in an individual European countries is never going to support two or three hundred startups in, say, photonics. Mm -hmm. Of course not. So the EU sets goals I that are unrealistic, <coughs> is what you said. I think, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's about it's quantity yeah. and quality. Yeah. And I think it starts way earlier than commercialization. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you look at the quality of our knowledge base um, at the universities, it's immense. Yeah. We're playing, still playing at the top level in the world. Are you uh, speaking to the Netherlands now? or you're The Netherlands, well, let, yeah. let's keep it to the okay. Netherlands. If you see the number of spin-outs from the universities, it's way too low. Mm. And why? Why is it why? too low? Well, it, um, it's, it's not really being valued within academia to be as a professor or as a researcher to, to spin out and to start your own company. You know, uh, your citation score is still the most important mm. uh, aspect uh, in your career. Uh, I think there is uh, not enough um, real early stage money, so pre-seed seed money available, and especially hardly any private money pouring into these, 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 these real early stage uh, sectors. 
And I think we have to transfer the whole system. And at, at the moment, I'm, I'm, I've been being asked to be the independent chairman to come up with a half a billion plan for the Netherlands to to really improve tech transfer in the Netherlands. And that's also bringing in, it's now really an inside out process and it should be a more dynamic circular process where you bring in way earlier investors, venture builders, experienced uh, serial entrepreneurs into the system and not, and I don't want to be harsh on the people who work really hard within, uh, within the tech transfer offices, but not academic bureaucrats who spin out companies. Uh, so we have to really, tra uh, what, the, 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 a huge transition is needed here. A systemic change is needed. Absolutely. Okay. But I think, I think perhaps also one of the, the big kind of hang-ups in, in sort of TTOs in Europe as well is when there is a spin-out, in most of Europe, they're taking far too much of the company. Absolutely. Where you've got... You've they got, take too much equity of the company. Yeah, the universities will be taking 20, 30. I mean, I've seen, you know, there has been some universities in Europe where I've seen trying to take 50% of the spin-out. That's mm. just absolutely ludicrous. And so, again, going back to how do you attract private investors, you're not going to attract private investors if your TTO is taking too much of the Sure, company. okay. So private investors, private no, investors no, are discouraged no, when... No, nor public investors. Yeah, no, exactly. The same thing. Okay. It's, it's so investors same. in general are yeah. discouraged I think, when... I think, honestly, most of the TTOs are working against... Uh, what would be best for the companies getting spun out? And may, 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 maybe to add one other thing, Irene. We're making a, a very strict distinction between private investors and public investors. Mm -hmm. But to bring in some nuances, if you look at most of the private investors, almost half the money they bring in uh, from their LPs is public money. If you look at the public investors, in a, in, especially in the Netherlands, they are privately organized. And 95% of my people have a private background. Mm. So I think the distinction between the two is not that big. Mm. Of course, it, uh, there is a distinction, and it is what is your prime focus? Is your prime focus to maximize financial return, or is it also to, to bring in societal impact? And it's end end. Of course, without a financial return, there is no future for our organization, but we don't have to, to, to bring in double digit financial returns. So we can focus more on uh, companies that need uh, patient risk capital, that have huge uh, technological risk, uh, that sometimes. Like deep tech, I guess. Like deep, like deep yeah. tech. Uh, sometimes that. that of course, have used societal impact when it comes to the environment or climate change, etc. So we, we can we can have slightly different focus, but still we need fi financial returns as well. And my other point is, most of the private investors they are in Europe uh, for for double digits, ranging from 15 to 50 percent, publicly funded. Mm. And what's interesting about that is, you see, Razio just did a report. So Razio is this large private equity fund asset manager that's sort of pan-European, that the percentage of government LP money in Europe in terms of percentage of overall fund is actually going up. So oh. it's interesting. So I remember being on a panel in Brussels 15 or so years ago with a guy from the EIF when the EIF was kind of just still in its relatively early stages. Uh, and one of his comments was he's like, ultimately one of our goals would be to not exist, to get to a point where as a government LP we were not needed anymore. Mm -hmm. In reality, in that 15 years, the EIF has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. And this morning, I think you shared on LinkedIn that in the top 10 most active investors in the Netherlands, eight were publicly funded. Yeah, I think that's what the stat yeah. that was sent to me. Was and Brabant was in the first place, by the way. <laughs> yeah. This is about the numbers. Yeah. It's not about the money. So if you look, for example, at the regional Deve development and investment agencies in the Netherlands, they're involved with nearly 50% of all early stage venture capital deals. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the amount of money, it's only 15 to 20% of, of the money. Mm -hmm. So they, they have this crowding in uh, role they're, they're playing, but it's, it's, uh, we, we shouldn't exaggerate what, what the influence is of the public investors. Okay, we sh shouldn't exaggerate it. We're almost out of time, so can we just name a few things that are going well? <laughs> if you can. I think, honestly, there is a lot, there's a lot that's going well. I mean, Europe, like, the, again, going back, the science and technology that Europe produces is phenomenal. I think Europe needs to focus on minimizing and reducing and eliminating the friction points that get between the scientist, the researcher, whatever, and, and the actual getting to a successful company. So that's, you know, eliminating the problems with the TTOs, eliminating the problems with commercialization, getting government to be much more active as a, a customer first resort, but also fixing the exit markets. Um, 
so there's a lot of work to be done. I think it is, there, is a lot, there are sectors within Europe, I mean, if you look at, it's, it's interesting, it's sort of the governments have focused on trying to get generalist VCs and, and sort of people coming from the software space to try to get them to transition to be deep tech investors. And I think it's a big mistake because we actually, the VCs who've been probably most successful in Europe, um, and there's data from the IF that backs this up, is actually the guys coming from the life sciences. Um, where Europe actually has, you know, six large successful pharmaceutical companies, great life science funds, and it's much more easy for, I think, a life science investor to then add a deep tech component or deep tech team than it is from a software perspective, because life science is, is deep tech, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I think, you know, going back to sort of to what government could do to be better, I think, I think they also need to look at what's the future of sort of deep tech investments, and they have to look at 20, 30 year horizons for that. Um, and see kind of what's the ecosystem that they want to have built in Europe. And getting SaaS investors to start doing deep tech deals, like I just, I just passed on a quantum deal because the lead investor literally has done, and the enti entire portfolio they've ever done is e-commerce and SaaS, mm -hmm. and they're leading a quantum round, which is just a jump too far. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a problem. And the other thing is, I think a lot of the European government LP initiatives have also forced far too many European funds to be geographically specific, where you have investors who, because of the LP agreements that they have, can only do deals in their home country, and that just creates an ecosystem where it incentivizes those VCs to just have really great networks in their home country, but that doesn't necessarily help their portfolio companies meet the right people in, in, you know, in Germany. If, if you're a French VC, you know the French market really well, but you might not necessarily know the Nordics. And, and I think these artificial restrictions, especially in a place like Europe, I think it's just, it, they have to go. So again, more integration, round of applause. <laughs> more integration is needed within Europe is one of the key points that you're making. Yeah, I mean, again, like, no, you know, God, this is, a friend of mine, Goldman Sachs, always says that Europe is made up of a bunch of wrong-sized economies. Um, and I think, I think Europe has to understand that, you know, talking about like the Dutch perspective, the Netherlands is what, 17 and a half million people, um, punches above its weight in some sectors, which is great, but the Netherlands is also not gonna be able to compete on every single sector of every mm. single thing, because it's just So again, it's focus possible, on the strengths, right? yeah. Um, and so I think doing things more of how does that fit into sort of a pan-European perspective uh, is gonna be more interesting. It's gonna just, the upside's gonna be a hell of a lot better. Noted. Rienke, final words from you. <laughs> Well, I, I'm a very optimistic guy. I, I see what is being needed here in the Netherlands and in Europe, and that is to come up with a new industrial policy and a true industrial policy, uh, focusing on where our strength is and not supporting the weak sectors in our economy, mm. uh, putting far more force between uh, the upcoming industries like photonics, quantum, etc., and uh, investing heavily into the, in, 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 uh, in the ventures in these, these industries. Uh, I think we have to come up with a vision about what uh, uh, open strategic autonomy means on a European level, not on a national level, mm -hmm. what economic resilience means uh, on a European level. And I think we, we somehow should uh, mobilize more private capital into these sectors. But the final end, I'm quite sure that um, for a long time to come, there's still uh, public money needed, especially in, in deep tech. Uh, tonight, I will, uh, I will sit beside my fireside and think about life sciences as deep tech. I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure if I agree. I think if you want to set up a very successful deep tech fund, you should do it with people who have a background in deep tech. Mm. Uh, either being it hardware investors or, or uh, experienced entrepreneurs. I totally agree with Michael that uh, all these uh, opportunistic investors who were uh, used in investing in SaaS and now turning into deep tech. Bad idea. You know, you know if, if, in, in, in the startup scene, every year you have a new buzzword. And this year it is deep tech. Uh, last year it was impact, the year before it was unicorn. I I'm very curious what it will be next year. So, uh, but I'm quite sure that, that we have to re-industrialize in Europe and it needs a lot of investments and a lot of courage and it needs a lot of involvement of the private sector um, and uh, we're we, we are ready to play our role there. You are ready to play your role there. Thank you so much. Michael Jackson and Rinke Zonnefeld. Thank you. Thank you.